I mean, you have control over how those episodes start. You don't have to start it like that. <laughs> that that's a good point. I'm just like preparing my vocal cords. Wow. Wow. How now, brown cow? How now, brown cow? I'm, I'm just going to let you go as long as you want to go on that. <laughs> well, I'm just about ready. <clears throat> I think it's very important that everybody knows who listens to the show that you're making me record it during the American Grand Prix. I mean, it's literally happening right now. And what is it, like 15, 20 miles away from here? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I normally don't wear a hat during the podcast because the seam of the hat disrupts my headphone placement mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I don't get a good nice seal around well, the cushions around my ear. But I'm wearing my hat right now, Daniel. <laughs> because, because that matters. You know, I biked over here and I wasn't wearing my hat while I was biking over here. And so if Lando doesn't win this Grand Prix, it's because I wasn't wearing my hat I mean, like, and that's all your fault. What if he spun out on the first lap? <laughs> Are you trying to like jinx it or something? Golly. <laughs> It's terrible, it's terrible, terrible. Anyway, that's I mean that's that's my whole pre-show, Daniel. Everyone's mad at you. Welcome back to the Camera Gear Podcast. I'm Daniel and I'm Lucas, and we're here today to talk about the gear, software, and techniques we use to shoot photos and video. I fixed my do not disturb thing. The thing where like you hold it upside oh, yeah? down, Not, it still doesn't do it if it's just like down. Mm-hmm. But I was having this issue whenever I would try to cycle. Whenever I what did wasn't holding it down when I pressed the button, it's supposed to cycle between silent and off. Uh-huh. And my problem was when it was in do not disturb, and I pressed the button, it would go off, and then it would turn on silent, and it would skip over do not disturb. Oh, weird. and I realized it's because I had an uh, automation set up so that it would uh, turn off do not disturb if it was turned on. And oh. I don't remember setting that up. It was just kind of like loosely in my automations. Mm-hmm. But it's weird because it wasn't set up to like trigger as an automation it was just a workflow huh. i don't know that's so, weird like i guess some of those things can kind of like conflict with each other and so you have to make sure it all is like playing nicely together it's yeah kind of so it was accidentally turning itself off uh, i fixed it and now everything is hunky dory nice and almost works as intended except for the whole pocket detection <laughs> thing which needs to get turned off related to uh, iphone follow-up at one point you had talked about how you were going to set all the camera buttons on the uh, on the phone to different cameras. <laughs> and I'm curious, now that you've been using it for a while, what are you actually using like those uh, screen shortcuts for? We don't do a follow-up on this podcast, Daniel. Uh, I am using, whenever I'm in normal mode, it is silent on the right, the little bell, mm-hmm. and then black magic camera app on the left, and then the action button is a toggle or whatever. To, whenever it's face down, it goes into do not disturb, and then whenever it's not face down, it goes into... Just turn all mm-hmm. notifications to zero. And then the camera button does the normal camera? Camera control, yep. And then whenever I'm in normal when I'm in silent mode, the um the bell thing turns into audio notes. I did not know that you could have different things on that home on that lock screen for the different modes. You can set up so you you can set any home screen lock screen combination to any focus mode. That's pretty cool. And so like and be, like and it can be whatever lock like home screen set up with widgets and other whatevers, but same with the lock screen. Mm-hmm. And so like my, I can, you can like easily tell am I in silent or not because it's a different wallpaper and like the clock looks different and the widgets are different That's and all that really stuff. Cool. So yeah, I mean, some people like don't use focus modes to change anything about notifications or anything. It's literally just like, I'm doing this now. Yeah. And so I want access to these set of apps mm-hmm. quickly but whenever I'm not doing that thing like work or a film shoot or at church or whatever, and I just want like a normal set of apps, mm-hmm. like you can kind of cycle okay. through. I feel like I need to mess with all this stuff. You more. could set up a shortcut that like you press the button and pops up a menu and you can just like, you can press the action button and pops up a menu. You could pick your, That's your cool. uh, thing or you could have it like cycle through three. You have three uh, different focus modes or something. I don't know. I'm going to play with it later. I like I like the two focus mode on the Switch because I'm usually just wanting to flip between two things. Yeah. And having that as like a mode switch of like this is my workout mode or this is work or this is home or this is entertain I don't know like you can I can I can easily think of like two different like modes of operation from my phone yeah and I like I like to be able to use the focus modes to switch between rather than using them for like silencing notifications yeah I think that makes sense another uh, cool thing I saw recently is that they just updated the Tesla app to where now you can put things like climate control for the car into the control center. Nice. Which I definitely need to set up. Yeah, you definitely need to do that. That's super cool. Yep. On my iPad, I have a home screen widget that 
uh, is like a stack of widgets. So it's just too high, but I can like scroll through them and I have different widgets set to like enable different modes so mm. that I can switch between quick. like focus yeah. home screens okay. on my iPad, but like really quick. And uh-huh. then like for the different screens, they can be in the same spot. So you can just be like, shoo, 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 boom, shoo, 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 boom. Just like that. Yeah. It, sound, it makes that sound too. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that's another shortcut. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Power user. Anyway, what are we doing here? Oh, right. Okay. So we're just looping back on things. Uh, everyone grab your bingo cards. That's very important. Uh, and then <laughs> it is on the website now and it's linked in the show notes. Sick. Okay. And then uh, whenever we're talking about the 16 to 55 Fuji lens last week, I thought it didn't extend. More information is out now about it and it definitely does extend oh, on the Zoom. Shame. So that was really, uh, yeah. really embarrassing. I'm not sorry. I don't care. Yeah. I'm Whatever. embarrassed for you, but you're not embarrassed for yourself. So. No, of course not. It was embarrassing. I'm not mm-hmm. embarrassed. Have you sold your other lenses yet? It's not out yet. Well, like, I'm always going to have like, no, <laughs> God, come on. I'm surprised you haven't already sold that 17 to 7. <laughs> just get it out of here. So hard. No. Okay. Uh, I, we do need to like, we, we just ran like super long last week because Lucas can't not talk about Fuji forever. And, and so we're going to talk about Fuji <laughs> so we're going to talk about Fuji. Uh, we didn't talk about the 500 millimeter prime. And so I wanted to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I think the Petapixel guy said that it was an affordable uh, 500 millimeter prime. That is basically true. Yeah. Yeah. So they released an XF 500 millimeter 5.6 prime Mm -hmm. and all signs point to this lens basically being the exact same lens as the GFX lens. (laughs) They just put a different mount on there. It's like what Sigma did with their 500 5.6 where they released it for L mount and for micro four thirds and everyone's (laughs) like, really? That's a pretty big difference. I feel like certain lens makers and camera manufacturers get a lot of flack whenever they're like, here's a full frame version of this lens and we remounted it to APS-C or we remounted it to some smaller mounts and everyone's like, why am I going to pay for all that glass whenever I don't even get to use it all? It's just not fair. Why do you remount the things? Uh, and it's like, it's literally what Fuji did here. I mean, you know, I, I Go kind from of... medium format APS-C. I kind of get the argument that, you know, maybe it's more expensive or it's bigger and heavier, but I think the reality is that if they didn't just take that approach, they probably wouldn't have made the lens at all. So, you know, maybe just be happy that the option exists if you want it. I am kind of in that court, like on the side of, yeah, like let's bring, let's bring full frame lenses to APS-C and not like have to redesign the whole thing. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe it's a good lens for APS-C and just kind yeah. of in the focal length it's in. I mean, it's not like I want that to be all the options because part of why I like APS-C is because the lenses can be smaller, but I mean, I'd love to have more choices. So yep. anything they want to take and remount to X-Mount, I'm all for. This one's cheaper on X-Mount. It's $3,500 on GFX and it's $3,000 uh-huh. on X-Mount. So it's a little cheaper, but not yep. a whole lot. And it's like reasonably sized. It's like nine and a half inches long or so. And it's about 1.3 kilograms. I mean, for a 500 millimeter prime, that seems totally fine. Like it's totally fine. What is interesting though, and I'm going to switch now to a spreadsheet that you don't have access to. <laughs> uh, mostly because I didn't copy paste it in the show notes. Uh, so I was, it, I'm like, how this lens is interesting in that a 500 millimeter full frame lens, those exist. There's actually not really too many of them. I think Sigma makes one and then there isn't a 500 millimeter prime for Nikon or for Canon. Oh, weird. But like, fine. So like, okay, 500 millimeters on medium format, which like digital medium format, it's a third stop larger. So if you try to like did the equivalent focal length, it's like 350 millimeters, I think. Okay. Because it's, I believe it's like a 0.71 crop factor. I double check my math here. 500 times 0.71. Bam. Yeah, it was like 355. Okay. So it's like a, th- call it like 350 to 400. Mm-hmm. If you were going to compare it to full frame, which Nikon and Canon both make like a 400. There's not a 400 millimeter prime for Lumix. Lumix is just kind of, you like, you get the 500 and that's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, L mount is not for telephotos. Long, Apparently. long telephotos. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Canon makes like multiple 400s. A six, a, no, they make a 600. They don't make a 400. They make multiple 600s and multiple 800s and a 1200. I mean, I guess these lenses are basically for sports and wildlife. Yeah, basically. The the Canon 600, they make an F4 version. That's $13,000. Oh, gosh. And so then the, uh, the 800 millimeter 5.6 is... 
is like thirteen or fifteen thousand dollars. I, mean, I feel like lenses like that are basically made to be rented out. Yeah, they're just enormous. Like there probably aren't that many people buying that lens. You just rent it if you need it for an event. Yeah, probably. So like this this GFX XF five hundred millimeter does not compete with those lenses. Yeah. Um. So I'm like, okay, like is five point six like a reasonable aperture for like GFX or for XF. I mean, 5.6 seems pretty good, but like if you're going to shoot animals and stuff, some of the reviews I've seen on the GFX, it's like, man, at 5.6, yeah, you could put a teleconverter on it, but it's, it's, that's like roughly F4 ish on full frame. If you're yeah. going to like work the math down, mm-hmm. but even still you're having to push your ISO up to like 80 or 900 on a dim day. Interesting. Or like yeah. 16, 1600 just to kind of like get enough shutter speed. Sure. Like, yeah. So sometimes that's, that can be a little limiting, especially if you have to like push the F stuff up. Yeah. But if you compare it to equally priced, like full frame versions, those lenses are like F11. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a pretty good aperture, all things considered. Yeah. So like it's a decent aperture. Um, and so like the two that I wanted to compare it to was like the Nikon makes a Z mount 400 millimeter F 4.5. It's like almost the exact same mm-hmm. kind of uh, brightness and focal length. And that one, it's the same length. It's like 9.3 inches. And it weighs like 100 grams less or okay. 200 grams Very less. Very similar lens. Yeah. And it's essentially the same price. It's like $3,250. Hmm. So if you're a Nikon mount, like you basically have the like uh, medium format equivalent of this lens for roughly the same price. But you basically don't have that in Canon. You can't, like there is not a like a 600 millimeter F4 hmm. or whatever for Canon. Okay. I think we felt like Nikon was maybe a little bit better on the telephoto mm-hmm. side of things in, in general than Canon. Yeah. If you're comparing it the other way, if you're looking at this for XF, that's like a 750 millimeter lens yeah. at 5.6, which is like <laughs> yeah, it is. decent. I mean, if you if you math that out to like what are, you know, apples to apples here, that's like an F8.3 equivalent. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you could compare that to like Nikon has an 800 millimeter 6.3, so like a little brighter. But well, that lens is sixty five hundred dollars. Oh, jeez! And it's a thousand grams heavier and like eight inches longer. Yeah, or yeah. six inches longer. That's like a totally different class of lens. Yeah, a little bit. And then Canon has an eight hundred f eleven, so slower, but it's a little lighter and it's a thousand bucks. Well, a thousand dollars is pretty compelling, but f eleven is not great. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like it's just kind of an interesting lens of like if you're shooting it on GFX, the closest equivalent is a Nikon lens, and if you're shooting it on <laughs> Fuji, the closest equivalent is a Canon lens. Yeah. <laughs> but even still, I think it's just kind of um, it's an it's an interesting beast in that on either mount, it is reasonably light for what it is. Yeah, it's reasonably fast for what it is, and it's reasonably cheap. I mean, and it's got like a ninety-five millimeter uh, filter thread. If you're on APS-C, it feels like if you're like into birding or something, this would be a pretty ideal lens. Yeah, it's. I don't know. I thought it was kind of interesting of like the concept of this lens fits medium format and it fits APS-C, and that's kind of weird. But also, they've somehow struck the balance of this lens isn't ungainly large on APS-C, and it's pretty compact on medium format yeah. and it's a decent price either way yeah so uh, seems pretty cool kind of impressive and the lens is particularly sharp it's a very good lens as far as like the gfx review of it mm-hmm. and so i'm expecting that you know cutting out the center whatever 50 percent of the lens is going to yield extremely good results yeah, I would and think so too. it's built to resolve to 100 megapixels mm-hmm. and so you're going to be able to resolve to the 40 megapixels on the center part of the lens yeah pretty good so it's it's I think it's an exciting lens, um, but I wanted to use this as the opportunity to dive <laughs> off into what other lenses that are not APS-C should manufacturers make for XF. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I because, wonder where you're going to start. Because if, G- if Fuji's doing it, they're just taking GFX lenses and making them. I mean, like, what's stopping people from taking full frame lenses mm-hmm. and remounting them to XF mount? And so I looked at all of Tamron, all of Sigma, and all of GFX's Fuji's GFX lenses, and I've made a list of all mm. the lenses that I want them to bring to XF mount by just remounting them and not doing anything else. Yeah, I can't imagine what we're, what we're about to hear, but go for it. Uh, Tamron makes a 70 to 180 2.8. I want that lens. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, lenses like that sound pretty good, honestly. Like, I didn't know they made that, and mm-hmm. that's pretty decent. It's like just a little longer than the 50 to 140. Yeah. Just yeah. a little. Mm-hmm. That would be cool. Uh, I think I think it's Tamron makes a, uh, the tw- or it might be Sigma twenty four to thirty five f two. That could be a good like interview style lens. Mm-hmm. Of, you know, pretty wide. You get a little bit of reach and good good uh, maximum aperture. Yep. And then obviously, like there was the DSLR 
APS-C lenses that Sigma made that they still haven't brought to mirrorless mounts, which is the 18 to 35 1.8, and then the 50 to 100 1.8, mm. which are for EF mount in APS-C size. I want those on XF. I forgot about that 50 to 100. Mm-hmm. I remember I remember now that that existed, but I had forgotten about that. I had forgot about it too. I had that fringer adapter. I feel like uh, if I was a lens connoisseur, I would just go buy these two lenses that they're mm-hmm. never going to make for my camera anyway. Mm-hmm. But I don't really feel like I want an 18 to 55 because I have so many primes in that focal range. <laughs> yeah, and those are 1.4 primes. And I would rather just shoot on a prime. Yeah. Or I'd rather take that money and buy the 18 millimeter 1.4 that is the linear focus motor or the 33 1.4. Both <laughs> of those would be amazing lenses. Anyway, but the 50 to 100 1.8, that sounds yeah. fun. Yeah, it's pretty cool range. It's like one stop faster. Mm-hmm. It's uh, a little shorter, but it's probably, it's probably huge. It's probably enormous. I bet it is, yeah. The, really the 18 to 35 was huge. Oh, yeah. Anyway, those would be great. Uh, there's a GFX 250 millimeter F4. Also sounds pretty decent because that's basically, it's it's like the, it's like using the teleconverter on the 50 to 140, but it's a little bit better than that, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because the teleconverter can get you to a maximum of 280, but it's at F5.6. So this would be a little bit better. Plus like, Optically, it's just going to look better. So Fuji makes a 200 millimeter f2, but that lens is five thousand dollars. The GFX 200 millimeter 250 millimeter f4 is like two thousand dollars used. I mean, you knew it's it's obviously more expensive. It's like thirty three hundred or yeah. something like that. But I Fuji's known for making here's the slow version of the prime. Here's the fast version of the prime. I would love it if they had a slower version that was cheaper. Of the 200 millimeter prime. Yeah. Let's bring that 250 F4 over. That seems like it would be nice. Yep. And uh, one more, there's a, or two more, there's a GFX 80 millimeter 1.7. There's like the 90 millimeter F2. There's the 56 1.2. Mm-hmm. And like, obviously, there's the Viltrox 75 1.4, which I think was 1.2. 1.2. Uh, which, that's, that's amazing. It's a good lens. Yeah. I love that lens. Uh, really want that, really want to get that lens, but you have it. And I feel like borrowing it's probably just going to be mm-hmm. the closest yeah, I get. Yeah. We could probably, yeah. Uh, we can probably transfer that at some point. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> just going to end up buying all of Daniel's Fuji gear. <laughs> but like a first party 80 millimeter 1.7 sounds good. Yeah, because like, right now they have the 80 millimeter uh, 2.8, mm-hmm. the macro. Yep, the, yeah, which is like, it's good. But if you want a like a portrait lens, that's not really a portrait lens. Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, you could use it for that. It's extremely sharp, but usually I want a little more shallow depth of field. The 90 millimeter F2 is basically the equivalent of that. And that's a super, super good lens, but I kind of wish it was a little faster. Mm-hmm. And uh, 1.7 is a little faster. I think there's like, like, for just remounting lenses, mm-hmm. let's do it. Yeah. Why not? And that's definitely all the lenses that I thought of. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I think you might have left one out. <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, Tamara needs to bring the 35 to 150 F2 to 2.8. <laughs> and I wrote next to it, why they scared. <laughs> I will say... When we get to the next topic where we're going to talk about a bunch of lenses and prices from different systems, I like. I guess I hadn't really considered how affordable that lens is for how fast it is and what range it has. So fast. And yeah, that, that would be a really nice lens. I'm just saying, Daniel, it's a decent lens, probably. I don't know. I've never <laughs> shot it. It's just like I just dream about it. Yeah, because it's F2 to 2.8. Mm-hmm. So on and the like wide end, it's, yeah. it's even better than 2.8. Yeah. Like they have, and, it's, and you're only getting F2 for like a little bit. Yeah, yeah, 50, yeah. 35 to 50 or whatever. But I mean, you can get that puppy for, whatever, $1,600 or something like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think from. it's 1800 new, but you know, usually you can find lenses used. Yeah. I'm like looking for it used right now. <laughs> You might just buy one, even though you don't have a camera that it'll fit on. I mean, maybe I should. I can get it for Nikon Z mount now. There you go. It's going to go great with my Z8. <laughs> I'm just going to have to switch to Nikon. <laughs> it's the only option. I'm going to sell all my food gear. I'm going to buy an XM5. <laughs> it's a cute little thing. And then I can use all my interchangeable lenses. That's true. <sighs> Anyways, that was that topic. Yeah. Um, it, I, I don't know. I, I kind of... I'd be surprised if we saw too too much of this sort of thing happen of taking full frame lenses and putting them on X mount, but no. I'd be here for it if it did. I don't think anyone's going to do it. I just want them to do it. Yeah, I had forgotten when I was looking at Sigma's lenses that they made, they brought the eight to ten to eighteen two point eight. 
I remember the 11 to 20 that Tamron did, mm-hmm. that ultra wide zoom, but I forgot that Sigma had the 10 to 18. Um, you're talking about on XF. On XF, mm-hmm. yeah, an APS-C lens. That's yeah. a pretty small lens. I think that's a perfect pairing for the XM5. Yeah, if you wanted to do vlogging, that's a good range. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty compact. I can't remember mm-hmm. exactly how long or small it is, but I, I kind of like the idea of a, of a 10 to 18 and the uh, XM5. Yeah. I think that's a nice little combo. I could see that. I was thinking about the XM5 more, and I think that even though the new... Uh, 16 to 55 seems like a really good lens. I could see an argument for getting the Sigma 18 to 50 to go with the M5 just because of how small that lens is. Oh, for sure. I I feel like if I had an XM5, I would want the 27 2.8 and then the two Sigma primes because mm-hmm. they're just they're so small. Well, you said you mean the two Sigma zooms. Thank you, the two yeah. Sigma zooms because mm-hmm. they're like they're just like super duper tiny. Yeah, and I think that would kind yeah, of I mean, be a perfect if, little it, build out. If you have a small camera, you kind of want small lenses to go mm-hmm. with it, and I think that. That would be nice. Which is really one of the reasons why I can't sell that 18 to 50 because like what if I yeah. what if I what somehow you like make up a reason to buy an XM5? I mean, honestly, I'm going to keep mine because I still have the XT30. Yeah. And that's a really good pairing with the XT30. <sighs> Sigh. Am I going to have to keep that lens? <laughs> Better that than the 17 to 70. Yeah, that one's gone. Getting it out of here. Get on. <laughs> okay, Daniel. Like, There was some other stuff on here that I've actually kicked down the line because I think that this topic is going to take about... Um, an hour and a half just, uh, just to chew through. So I don't think it's going to take that long. What are we talking about here? So I started, you know, we had an episode a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the Canon C80. And toward the end of that episode, I was like, yeah, C80's looking like a pretty good camera. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe Canon RF mount isn't all that bad. Uh, and so one question it made me ask was, you know, we joke a lot on this show and talk a lot on the show about how expensive Canon RF lenses are and how it's just like unrealistically expensive compared to everything else. But I kind of think that our frame of reference for how expensive lenses are RF is... RF frame of reference. Uh, I kind of think that our frame of reference for how expensive lenses are is a little <laughs> off because we shoot APS-C. And it made me wonder, like, is it really that much more expensive than other systems. And so that was kind of where I started on this topic. Do we need to take one more step back and talk about why you want a like video dedicated video, almost cinema camera so bad? Yeah. So getting, getting to that, I started off looking at the lenses, but yeah, I mean, really like the motivation behind thinking about that was, you know, kind of that question of like, we talked about the black magic Pixis earlier this year and then C80 came up. I make jokes about the DJI Ronin 4D like every week. And yeah, this is kind of like, Circling around this topic of, you know, does it make sense to get a dedicated video, like more cinema style camera? And if so, out of the options that are kind of out there right now, which one would actually be the best choice? And I mean, hopefully that's useful for people beyond just me, because I feel like the kind of work that we do is, you know, not uncommon. I think a lot of people do stuff like this with video. And so, yeah, it'd be interesting to talk about some of these options that are out there like a do you need this type of camera at all and then b like between these choices like kind of how do the prices line up what would you be looking at you know like like what is what is the lay of the land okay all right and now you're going to talk about why you need why you need a cinematic camera <laughs> like why you need a c80 or a pixis or an fx6 or an fx fx3 why is that on here i don't know why is it on there or, or a ronin 40 or there's there's no red cameras on here well i mean i think there's more there's more possibilities maybe than what i've listed and mm-hmm. i'm curious to see what your thoughts are but i mean so kind of i guess the reason that i started thinking about it and i want you to tell me if you think this is valid or not but you know we shoot interviews we shoot music videos uh we film at events and, you know, we've had ideas of like shooting some short film stuff. We haven't really done that. And I'm just always wanting to push the quality forward. Like, how mm-hmm. can we make things look better? And you always hear that, you know, like using an actual cinema camera, you're, you're getting better quality. Like in some ways it's noticeably better. You have more dynamic range, maybe just a more pleasing image. And you also get features that, you know, make it a little bit simpler or more pleasant to use. You know, you get waveform built in, false color. Uh, you know, maybe some of the workflow stuff, if you want to shoot in raw or use time code, like there are advantages to having a camera like that. And I just feel like I'm stuck in this weird spot where Fuji's not really giving us some of those features that we want to see. Like the time code support still feels a little finicky, not getting waveforms or anything on the X-H2S. And Fuji doesn't really have a camera that fits into this space. 
And so naturally you start thinking like, you know, what are the other options that are out there? Well, Daniel, I think it's important that you and everybody remember that there is a segment on the show where I dig up uh, 10 year old cinema cameras and try to convince <laughs> you to buy them because like maybe they're still valid. And like an been, original red camera? They're sure going to get like a Helium 8K <laughs> or like a, an old uh, Sony Cine Alta. It was like the F thirty five or something like that. It was, mm, well, I it was a that. pretty decent, yeah. you know. Mm. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have, we have, I've tried to talk about this before, but somebody wasn't interested, and yeah. all of a sudden, Dan was interested. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So, what are the minimum lenses that you would need? Like, so we, we talked about like cinema, documentary, interview, mm. music, video, blah 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 blah. What are the minimum lenses that that you would need for these cameras? Well, I think that you really have to kind of step back and think about what is it for? Because to me, I, I've, I've realized thinking about this, that I think doing event shooting is a totally different set of lenses than Definitely. what you need for the other stuff. Cause yeah. if you think about something like shooting an interview, doing a film, you can, for one thing, you could probably just get by with primes, but really you could do a lot with like a 24 to 70 and maybe a couple of primes. Mm-hmm. Like let's say you had like a 24 to 70 a 35 and an 85. I feel like you could get pretty far with that. Oh yeah, definitely. Whereas if, and you're, if you're Wes Anderson, you only need the 35. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if you're doing events, suddenly it's like, how am I going to get by without a 70 to 200? Yeah. And so that's, I think that's a big question is, do you want one camera that can do all of the video stuff or is it okay if it's more of like a, you know, for a focused set of needs? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, maybe you just but, need like a 24 to 120. Yeah, maybe so. Or I mean, 28 that's, to 105. That You know, like that's that's the other thing is that they make lenses like that that kind of cover that whole range. But I guess like one thing that gets me stuck there is, you know, let's say you go with like a 24 to 105. Is that a lower quality lens? And if so, like optical quality. And if so, does that offset the reasons to get a camera like this? I uh, I don't think so. I think it I think it just super depends. I think depending upon what you're shooting, something being a little softer on on a can make it like if you have a high enough quality sensor that's producing really good footage, having a less sharp image will make something look better mm-hmm. in a way. It'll make it look more cinematic. Uh which can make it look more professional. Interesting. Uh, Cuz you're comparing it to movies yeah. versus something that looks if it's extremely sharp and god forbid like digital it's gonna mm. look like a phone uh, and i think true. that i think that that's pretty triggering for people yeah the shallow depth of field is the other thing that really helps things stand out which mm. like for video i mean 5.6 f8 like those are going to be great because then you actually get things in focus yeah but being able to bring that down is going to be helpful i think f4 on full frame is going to be perfectly fine and if you're looking at Canon, they make, I mean, I guess I don't know about the RF. I can't remember if that 24 to 105 F4 is an L mount, L series lens or not. I think it is. But the the one for EF was, it was an L series lens, but it was F4 and it was comparably expensive. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it was reasonably expensive. Mm-hmm. Expensive, reasonably cheap, comparably cheap, comparably expensive. Anyways, whatever. You get it for like 1200 bucks or something. Yeah. And to me, like that is, that's a, perfectly acceptable lens for a lot of things that you could shoot decently sharp it's not like super perfocal or anything but i think that would be completely reasonable and it wouldn't discount the camera itself though i think to a certain extent it's like if you're spending five thousand dollars on a camera and then cheaping out on the lens (laughs) you're doing it backwards yeah yeah that's an interesting uh thing to think about so we've got two parts we could look at here one is like what cameras are there that sort of fit this rough set of requirements and mm-hmm. then the other is how do the lens systems compare which one do you think we should start with? uh let's talk about which cameras so that we can set the stage for the lenses sure. so and i'm gonna look up the right cine alta i think it was the <laughs> fx5 <laughs> anyway i don't think it was the fx5 it might have been an fs5 uh yep anyways go on so a couple of options that i thought of i mean the one that kind of Sparked this again for me was the C80, which just, you know, was just announced, hasn't quite come out yet. Um, but Canon C80, that one's 5,500 new. Uh, there's also the previous C70, which is 4,500 new, or you can find them used for somewhere around 3,500. Uh, we've also talked about Blackmagic uh, and the Pixis, and that one's $3,000 new. 
that one's just now coming out. I think it is available now. It's like just, just shipped yeah. like a few weeks ago. Yep. Uh, and then on the Sony side, I felt like needed to, like Sony to me is an obvious player in the space, but their cameras here are a little bit older. So one is the FX, FX6, which we were a little bit off. We said they were the same price, but I think like the normal non-sale prices, the current FF, FX6 is $6,000. So it's a little more expensive than the but C80. But it's been as low as like 5000 or 5500 Yeah. Sometimes it goes on sale. You can also find them used for a little cheaper. So sure. somewhere in that range. Um, and then- like I kind of felt like I had to at least put the FX3 on this list because the FX3 is like a little bit lower in that, you know, a little bit lower in that range. Right now it's $3,900 new. Uh, so it's like kind of competing in that C70 range. But sure. The problem that I have with both of the Sony cameras is they, you know, they're just a little bit on the older side. Like it feels like they're due for an update that that we haven't seen yet. And the FX3 in particular just doesn't really feel like it fits this set of requirements, like looking for something that's more of a cinema style camera. I mean, to me, the FX3 basically just feels like a souped up mirrorless camera. Like it's basically an A7S3 with, you know, like a little, a little extra. I don't, I don't, I would, I would kick the FX3 off this list. Yeah. It just seems like not, not really what we're talking about here. Maybe, maybe it's not fair, but, um. I'm an elitist. <laughs> I mean, this is our podcast. I mean, I don't know if I was like, if I looked at this list of cameras and I was like, which one of these have had a major motion film shot on it? I think we should take that one off the list. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be the only one that has had a major <laughs> motion film shot on it. I mean, I don't know. I, I should probably do some research. Yeah, maybe so. You can't make me. <laughs> uh, I think I found on eBay a few Sony Cine Alta F55s for like $2,000. Now, sure, it's a 12-year-old lens. <laughs> lens -year camera. Lens. Sure, but but you could put, you can you can get it with a PL mount. <laughs> so you can put like your, your fancy pants cook lenses on there. It shoots S-Log2 at uh, ISO 250. And you can shoot 4K, which means it probably has an 8 megapixel sensor. 8.9, thank you. Uh, I, don't, I don't see why this wouldn't be on the list. <laughs> Maybe it should be. Lucas. According to this marketing material from Sony, it has higher emotions. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's part of the HDR section. I don't know what that means. I don't know how it can have higher emotions. Unless it's like the maybe the menu system's the old Sony menu system, and maybe that emotion is anger. Maybe. Uh, it looks like it supports Asus. Anyway, so you want me to put this one on the list? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be looking at that camera. Okay, we'll come back to it. I don't really want to buy a camera on eBay, for one thing. Fine. Fine, fine, fine. I'll buy it. <laughs> and then you can be jealous. I don't know what kind of PL lenses I'm going to get, though. Yeah, those aren't even exactly. on this list. I mean, yeah. did you look those up for me? No, no, sure didn't. <sighs> <laughs> well, the Cook ones are going to be really expensive. <laughs> it's going to take a while. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyways, so where, where should we start here? So yes. you got those those four cameras. Mm -hmm. If I was looking at if I was looking at the C80, 70, Pixis, and FX6 for you... I would say I like the FX6 as an option, but I would wait for the Mark II, and I yeah. think that one's going to blow everybody out of the water. And if for some reason that camera is $6,000 and not $9,000, I think it would be really enticing. <laughs> I think that the CD, C80 is incredible, but it's hard to push for that when the C70 is such a bargain. The C70 has obviously gotten a little old, but it's still very viable as a, like a cinema-type camera. It seems like the biggest difference, I mean, so the C80 is better in a lot of ways. We talked about that in the episode, some of the ways it was improved, but I think maybe the most meaningful one is the sensor being APS-C versus full frame. I think that's Definitely. just like, you can't, you can't. Super ignore 35, that. Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I should have said. Super 35, same size, but yeah. like you can't really ignore that in that conversation because it affects low light, it affects the focal length of the lenses. It makes it feel like the C80 is a pretty big step up, but it would be pretty tempting to get a C70 at $3,500, get the lenses, and then eventually get a C80. Yeah, I think that that makes sense as an upgrade path. And I can't remember if the C70 shoots open gate, but I'd be surprised if it doesn't. It isn't 6K. Yeah. It's 4K. That's the problem with the C the C70 is it maxes out at 4K. Yeah, and I think that we shoot enough of 6K that it's like we never deliver on 6K, but... Mm -hmm having that resolution provides a lot of opportunity for reframing yeah. in post, which we do frequently mm -hmm. in order to like get 
two shots out of one shot or yeah. like tighten up the framing or whatever or do a vertical or all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So I think that that's a pretty big limiting factor. I think that the Pixis is maybe more appealing if you want to work in raw. Yeah, I think the Pixis is a good fit for that use case and it's so much cheaper than some of these other options. But in terms of like, I mean, the biggest limitation I think the Pixis has is it doesn't have an H.265 codec. So you have to, you basically have to use raw for your final delivery. Yep. I wouldn't want to deal with run and gun with a Pixis. Yeah. If I was going to do like any sort of documentary or event type shooting, the it just feels less mobile in a way. I'm sure you could kind of like get it there, mm-hmm. but you're manually focusing everything. You're dealing with giant file sizes and like you're going to get good images, but I don't think it's as maybe flexible as a C80 or a C70. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That's kind of where I land on it. If I had a workflow that was just like getting the best footage or doing live streaming where I wasn't capturing, I wasn't like pulling the footage off, I would I would lean towards the pixels. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is kind of where I think that it comes back to what you really want the camera for, because even like like Pixis to me feels very much suited to like short film type stuff, or like you said, like a live streaming setup would be great. If you want to do interview type things, I think any of them work. If you start wanting to do something where you're like grabbing the camera and running around, that's where it gets a little bit trickier. And I think having autofocus could be a plus in those situations. But thinking about like, let's say FX6 versus C70, C80, like I think about camera form factor a little bit. And the FX6 is a, like it looks like a cinema camera. It's a big, big box. And you do have a screen on top of it. So like that, the ergonomics there are good. And you can always rig something up, you know, to, to have like handles and stuff. So that seems fine. But I feel like the C70 and C80 kind of win in that part because you can like, like those look basically like a large mirrorless camera. And so you can just kind of pick up the camera by itself and run around with it if you want, if you want to. And I could see for event stuff that being kind of like a nice option to have. I think that in this price range and like in this category of thing, you I mean, you you talk about these cameras that are available. Maybe there's a few other things like um, an old Red Komodo or something like that. Mm-hmm. But in well, the, the, the Red Komodo is going to have the same problem as the Pixis. Yeah, but like any of the things that are going to shoot not raw, like have some sort of ABC H two six five XOCN whatever type codec option that's some sort of flexible compressed not raw for like some quick turnaround type solutions i mean it feels like you kind of have the list here and it seems like you're either getting a high-end mirrorless style camera or maybe something like this and if you're trying to steer more towards something like this instead of mirrorless like canon's kind of the only game in town until sony refreshes the fx6 yeah or you stick with something like an Mm X-H2S or an S1H or like a R5 Mark II or something like that. And the, uh, you know, we have to consider the the S1H Mark II is theoretically coming someday. But I think you can kind like we can kind of extrapolate what the S1H Mark II is probably going to be. Yeah. And I feel like it's going to be it's going to be like an FX3 or whatever. Yeah, Actually, exactly. not quite. It's, it's, it's going to be very much a mirrorless camera. It's going to be like an like a Z8 or whatever. Yeah. Or yeah. like an R6 or 5 Mark II. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be a mirrorless camera that is really good at video. Yep. And then they, maybe they make a BS1H Mark II or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, but even that may come later. Yeah. Like that may not be even Even happen. later. And mm-hmm. it'll still, it'll be the same camera in a different form factor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. I don't know. I think... Uh, I guess we we haven't really answered the question of like, does this like does this make sense? So I mean, what's your opinion? Like, you think with the type of you know with this type of work, like whether it's you and me or somebody else listening to this that does kind of similar things, does it make sense to get a camera like this, or are you better off just using you know XH two S that kind of thing? I don't know. I think that you can get a really long way with mirrorless cameras. And something like this maybe gives a little more growth opportunity if you're needing to do more with some advanced features like time codes or like, I guess these don't support like Genlock or anything, but if you're needing like multiple outputs, like I want a director display and to have an external monitor for my camera. Mm-hmm. If you're needing to get into those kind of workflows, you're going to quickly run into the limits of a mirrorless camera. 
But if it's like just you and your buddy and you're like shooting a few things and you got a couple cameras set up and you're not really like running those back on a Terra deck or anything along those lines, I think mirrorless is probably where you stay until you need to grow into something else. I think that the C70, 80, and then up to the C400, like those are all going to match and they're kind of a nice little growth path and they give an opportunity to, to advance along kind of like that type of filmmaking, like doing documentary or interview or whatever. And if you want to be able to run everything back to a single monitor and you want to have maybe more people involved or be, have it be more complex, then I think that these cameras make sense. And I think that the, the Canon options make a little more sense right now over the other ones. But I think that the Sony options are going to be better and have a higher top end long term. I just right now wouldn't buy an FX6 over a C80 unless I was just super invested in the lenses. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really curious to see what that FX6 Mark II is going to be. I mean, we think it could be coming like early next year or something. I mean, it's got like the rumors have been out there, but Mm -hmm. you know, who really knows? I think it's going to be really exciting when it does. It's just like, Things like the Liberano seem cool. I know that that one's kind of been turned on a little bit. Mm-hmm. wasn't as awesome as we all had wanted it to be, but I think it's still a really good option with the like autofocus and everything. And then obviously, like if you know how to shoot on a Barano, you know how to shoot on an FX9 or an FX6, you're going to know how to shoot on a Venice. Yeah. And then you can kind of sell your services as like, I can also camera operate a Venice, mm-hmm. uh, which like to an extent where you can actually learn the camera. But even still, it's like the Sony option, you can grow from an FX3 all the way up to a Venice 2. Versus the Canon is like your kind of cap out at the C400 and that's basically it. But it just kind of depends upon where you're wanting, like where you see the things that you shoot growing into. Mm-hmm. And if it's like you're content kind of in this one category, that's more like documentary event or interview. I think that you could have a whole career in the Canon, Canon lineup and it'd be fine. Yeah. It's interesting how they, I think we may have talked about this with the C80 episode too, where it, they, they, like Sony and Canon are both playing in this space, but I feel like they kind of fit different niches within it. Certainly. Like, like it seems like Canon is more on the lower, like they have, they have better showings more on this lower end. Whereas Sony, like you said, has a higher ceiling. I think that Canon has a higher floor and a lower ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'd agree with that. Yeah. So you have this spreadsheet with lens prices. Yeah. So that was the other thing I, you know, kind of wanted to think like, you know, C80 looks really cool, but, you know, uses Canon RF, not super happy about that. And I started trying to price out, you know, what do lenses actually cost? And so I got on B&H and, you know, looked up a bunch of lenses and I compared between Canon, uh, so Canon RF, L-mount and Sony E-mount to try and figure out, you know, what, what do things look like just within that range? And so I have a bunch of lens prices. And, you have so many lenses yeah, on your Daniel. I was just trying to like, because... So for Canon, there's there's a pretty limited set of options just because it's only Canon. You can't really get anything else that, you know, fully supports the mount. I mean, you can always get PL lenses. That's true. Yeah. Well, I mean, or you could convert to EF, which is another, like, another interesting option. There are so many EF lenses. Yeah. Uh, but for, so, so for specifically, though, looking at RF, I, I, you know, you only have Canon. But then when you go to L-mount, you've got Sigma as well as Lumix. And same thing for E-mount. So you've got Tamron and... Uh, you know, and Sigma as well as Sony. And so it's just a lot of possibilities. But like, for example, let's just look at like the standard, you know, standard zoom, 24 mm-hmm. to 70. Sure. You have to consider, you know, the, the, there's always like the 24 to 70 F 2.8. I feel like that's kind of the standard choice. But then yep. at least on Canon, you also have like, they make a 28 to 70, Mm -hmm. which I don't think is an L mount or sorry. I don't think it's an L series lens. Right. Uh, but you know, it's like you have an expensive one and a cheap one. And sometimes you see that with the other systems too, but okay. So Canon 24 to 70 F 2.8, that's an L series lens, Mm -hmm. $2,400. Pretty pricey. Yeah. Uh, if you look at L mount, same lens, 24 to 70 F 2.8, this is where I think it's interesting. So, if you look at the Sigma option, the Sigma 24 to 70 F 2.8 is $1,200. Sure. Which is literally half the price. 
Yes. But if you're looking at the Lumix version of the lens, the Lumix 24 to 70 is $1,900. So again, it's still cheaper than the RF mount. But right. That's a whole lot closer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then on the Sony side, you kind of have some interesting options with Sony. So the Sigma one, you can get that same Sigma lens for E mount. So that's $1,200. Yep. Uh, you can also get the 24 to 70 F 2.8 G Master for $1,700. And then now they have a G like a G, G Master Two, yeah, Mark Two, yep, which is twenty two hundred dollars. That's a good lens. Yeah, the so, from what I understand, the twenty four to seventy is between those two lenses as far as capability. The which the Sigma twenty four to seventy two point eight is between the yeah. Sony G Master One and G Master Two. Oh, interesting. Okay. If you are kind of like compare their performance, mm-hmm. so the Sig the Sigma is a really good deal then. It's a decent lens for sure. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of like. Like that's that's kind of one snapshot of what you see with these lenses, where the RF one is more expensive, but it's if you if you consider that the RF lenses are generally really good in terms of image quality, I feel like they are fairly price competitive with the best lenses for the other system that you can get. Yeah, it's just a matter of like, do you where do you want to save the money? And Canon doesn't seem to want to. Or doesn't seem to make like a cheap 2.8 version. They're just going to make an f4 version. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily see a problem with that. I mean, they kind of just don't want to make a bad lens, I guess. Yeah, uh, it's just a different strategy. Extent. Yeah, it is. And if I was in the Canon world and looking at this list of lenses, I would say the 24 to 105 f4, and then a 70 to 200 2.8 is probably where I would want to land, though. The idea of mixing, having one of those be faster is mm, questionable. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, then the, you're going to have trouble mixing exposures. I feel like the 24 to 105 f4 is a like a pretty a pretty compelling lens for RF because it's, I think, $1,300. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty affordable. The thing that gets weird is like, you know, kind of going back to the camera choices, I think that's great on full frame. But I think on the Super 35 C70, that F4 is kind of painful. Yeah, it's and the 24 millimeter on the wide, and it's kind of painful. Mm-hmm. I don't wouldn't necessarily love that as an option on the C70. Yeah, you can get the RF to EF speed booster and shoot an EF version of that lens and get the full width of it. Mm-hmm. But Canon doesn't really make Super 35 zooms that are of this quality for like that format. Yeah. You just don't make them. Yep. And so that makes the C70 kind of a hard option because you're dealing with the crop. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, that's where the, the sensor size on that is sort of interesting. I guess also just to mention, so the 70 to 200s, uh, you know, generally for 70 to 200, you can find an F4 or an F2.8. So like price comparison across the three. The Canon RF uh, 70 to 200 F4 is $1,500 uh, for L mount. If you get the Lumix uh, version of that lens, it's $1,400. So uh, mm-hmm. pretty similar, $100 cheaper. And then uh, on Sony, it's $1,700. So the Sony one's actually more expensive. But mm. those are all pretty similar. Yeah. If you go with the F2.8 version, uh, RF is $2,500, and I think that price is on sale. That's a very expensive lens. Yep. Uh, on L-mount, you can get the Sigma for $1,500 or the Lumix for $2,200. Sure. So, I mean, to me, it seems like the Lumix is similar to like the G Masters, just more expensive. Yeah, yeah. And then on Sony, the 2.8 G Master is $2,000, and yep. the G Master 2 is $2,800. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's so. just the cost of a high-end full-frame yeah. Mm-hmm. 7200 yeah so again like pretty competitive prices across the three yeah just kind of makes it feel like like you could get into rf mount again i don't want to but like i, I mean you sold that 85 f2 i did yeah what if you bought I that should, lens again i should buy it back <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know like i think what's painful about it is that i feel like out of these three systems i feel like rf mount has the least interest for me in terms of non-cinema type cameras Mm -hmm. because i mean 
the R5 Mark II seems like a really good camera. Yeah, it does. I think the R6 Mark II is also, uh, you know, at least not a bad camera. Like, it seems fine. Got full frame 4K60. But I have a hard time getting excited about options like that, whereas... Because they don't have film simulations? Yes, yes. Where, whereas, like, an L-mount, I could see an S9 being pretty cool. Yeah, sure. And, you know, or even, like, S5 Mark II. It's got waveforms. To... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. L- LUT support. On Sony... You've got things like the ZV-1 that, sure. that you're really into. I would be really into that camera. Yep. It's the, got autofocus, Daniel. The A7CR. That's, that's that, yeah. That's their compact. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, because if you if you bought into a, like, here's my cinema camera, you would also want your mirrorless camera to be of the same mount so that you could share lenses. Well, maybe, but that's the question, right? So I kind of started thinking about that, and then I realized, do I really want the same lens that would be good for a cinema camera that I would want on something like a Lumix S9. Like what is the scenario where I want a Lumix S9 with a 24 to 70 F 2.8? Yeah, you wouldn't like, you know, it feel it feels like if you want your like fun little travel camera, you probably want a pancake lens sure. or some prime or something. Yeah. That doesn't feel like what you'd use a cinema lens for. Sure. So I don't, and actually, you already have an XT 30. Yeah. So I don't actually know if it's, I don't know if looking at other cameras in the same ecosystem necessarily even like factors in. I don't know. This yeah. is why this is complicated. I think that's reasonable and also it like depends on what you want to shoot. I mean, if you need to be able to autofocus with your fancy cinema camera on your C80 or FX6 or whatever, you're going to want like a first party lens that can manage those motors. Right. But if you're going to manual focus it, then you're looking for something that's par focal and What's the other one? Para foc- paras, par- the, where it doesn't it doesn't change focus when you zoom in. Yeah, that's par focal. What's the other one? Focus breathing. Yep, that's the one I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. You want it to be like limited on its breathing, and you want it to be par focal. Yeah, and which is a different trade off. You're not necessarily going to get that with a seventy to 200, 2.8 point eight for L mount. Mm-hmm. It's just instead you're going to want to get something that's maybe more meant for I don't know video shooting. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. I guess like the uh, the L mount primes that they came out with are all pretty decent on their breathing because Panasonic knows that a lot of their stuff is more video focused. Mm-hmm. I don't know how good or par focal or whatever the seventy two hundred two point eight on L mount is. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't know how it compares to all of these other lenses. Mm-hmm. I would with the prices being close enough, I would think that that would weigh into my decision. Like if I was picking between two cameras that are very similar and I was weighing the options of their lenses. One, the secondary option of being able to mount it to another camera, like how easy is that and what are the other options in that camera ecosystem is a huge part. But then the other huge part is like, does the zooms on this camera like defocus when I zoom? Right. Or can I actually like do a push pull zoom and it, Mm. and it holds frame? Yeah. Yeah. I think those are good things to consider. It's, I think the tricky part is that, it's like this multivariable equation you're trying to solve for because the problem mm-hmm. is you don't really have comparable cameras between these systems. Yep. Like, I feel like when I look at the cameras, the C70 and C80 are pretty far and away better than the other choices. Mm-hmm. Like, both in terms of, you know, this feels like it would be small enough to, you know, be able to carry around and use and, you know, kind of has like the feature set that I want. Yeah. It feels like the best option there. Yeah. But, like, I I don't like the idea that there's only first party lenses for it, mm-hmm. and yeah, I, f- I feel like Canon has the least interesting like lineup of other cameras that aren't in the cinema, you know, in the cinema space. It's just like if you're wanting to buy into a very round lens ecosystem, most lenses are round. Like you know, if you look at them, sure. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. very very good point. Very good point, Daniel. <laughs> Uh, they should make square lenses because the sensors are square. No. What are we doing? I think that, I mean, obviously it's like Sony, right? I mean, there's there's so many yeah. Sony I lenses. Sony wins the lens competition for sure. Yeah, for sure. And so it's like if you're thinking about, like, do I want options that are cheap as dirt all the way up to $20,000 or more? Like, you got, like, you obviously you're going to go into the Sony and there's, like cheap cameras as far as like FX3 all the way up to super expensive cameras like the Murano. Mm-hmm. And I mean like I feel like Sony is the most flexible of these options but I think that you know 
Canon is, Canon's like a, an Apple like experience where it's like they have a certain set of products. It's more limited. They're all really good and you're going to get a really good experience out of using them, but you have to like live in Canon's world. Yeah. I don't know if I'm prepared to live in Canon's world. Uh, you'd probably love it. <laughs> I feel like when I look at all this information, like the thing that is most tempting to me is to get a C70 or C80 and get like a 24, either like a 24 to 70 or 24 to 105, like one standard ish zoom and get like the 85 prime, something like that. And just start there and then build up over time. Like not necessarily have to buy the 70 to 200 on day one. Like I feel like that's what meets the needs I have in mind best, but it's just, it's not a, it's not a clear cut decision. You know, like I wish, I wish all these brands had more cameras to choose from. I wish there were more like possibilities in all these ranges and it makes it uh like, I never thought I would even consider going back to Canon RF, mm -hmm. but well, that's why you sold all your stuff. Yeah. But in this particular like market segment, I feel like Canon does this really well of like, lower end cinema camera that has really good autofocus, like good for run and gun. Like they compete really well in that space. And yeah, it's hard they to do. ignore that. And they have like a lot of really good lenses on here. There's a couple ones that you didn't even put on here. They have that, what is it, 28 to 70 F2? Or is it 24 to something? So they do have a 28 to 70 F2.8, which I put on the no, list. No, no, no. And that the one's $1,100 because it's not an L series lens. The other one you're thinking of, I think, is a 28 to 105, maybe? They make a 24 to 105 f2.8. Yeah, that's, that's like, the $3,000 mm -hmm. lens. That lens is everything, Daniel. That one you <laughs> could, like, plug. I think you can get the, you can get the auto, like, the, the, focus, motor. the motor thing, slap it on the side, plug it into the front of the C80, and then just, like, run that thing with no yep. hands. Yep. That, Daniel, like, <laughs> you could just buy that lens. Yeah. Like, you could buy only that lens and you can be happy for so long. Can you can you imagine if I did that? If I bought like a C80 and a three thousand dollar lens and just had that one lens for the camera, it'd be wild. Okay, they can make, you imagine just having a single lens for a camera? You, you can't, don't. You can't imagine it for everything you shoot. Like we shoot, we shoot a lot of like we shoot a lot of APS-C stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're ever shooting at one point two or one point four, except for like low light telephoto. Yeah. Like you're, you mean you're usually shooting at 2.8, mm -hmm. which is basically f4. Yeah. I don't think that you need need quote unquote anything faster than 2.8, really. Maybe like one mm -hmm. prime that's slightly faster. And 24 to 105 is basically going to do it for most of the things. You, like you probably are going to need something a little longer, something yeah. in the 200 millimeter range. So like it can't really be your only lens, but I would say that 80 percent of what you shoot could be done on 24 to 105 2.8. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I and even I, I, honestly on full frame, I even think the f4 version of the lens would probably be fine. It's a 28 to 70 f2 that you can get for yeah. Canon, mm -hmm. uh, which is $2,800. Yes, it's very expensive. I think between those two choices, I would get the 24 to 105 2.8. Yeah. I, would, I would accept the slightly worse aperture for that extra range. Man, I would love a 24 to 70 f2 though. I yeah, think it's just a chonker. Yep. Anyway, so like it's not on your list here. And obviously it's three thousand dollars. <laughs> but I so think that money. like the utility that you can and that lens is huge. Yeah. It is enormous. But the utility that you could get out of that pairing a C eighty mm -hmm. and that lens is pretty good. Yeah. It's like pretty good. You could you could say that I can buy one less lens. You like you could reasonably sure. say that. And I'm I don't know. It's it just depends on like how much telephoto you need. Mm -hmm. I think that just to keep talking because like I can't let you get a word in the if you were going to go C70 I think that if you did that it would it would be to save cost and well this it would is be, I actually wanted to ask you this is do you think C70 to C80 is a reasonable like does it make sense to start the C70 or do you just go for C80 out of the gate I think it depends on what you're trying to do I think that the and I'm looking I'm just looking at your lens list here but there are not a lot of good options, particularly zooms, in RF mount for Super 35. Yeah, I and think I agree with that. I think that it would be extremely limiting to be at 24 on the wide end for a zoom for a camera that you're like going to set up an interview shot. It's going to mm. be, it's like most of the stuff we shoot like 35 to 50 for our A roll, but like even still, it's nice to be able to go wider. You're not going to get really good establishing shots. You're going to have to have another another lens. Yep. And, and, and you could do the 
could do the EF to RF speed booster. Which is kind of where I'm going. The the RF lenses are sharper, better, lighter. They're just better lens. They're so much better lens. They're going to autofocus faster. They're super, super good. The EF lenses are going to be way cheaper. You're going to find a ton of them used. And you can get the speed booster to get the full frame equivalent. And it's a first party speed booster. So like yeah. it'll be fine. We've both shot with adapters to a, a pretty good extent. And it's it's mostly annoying. Yeah. It's another it's thing you have to deal with. It never feels like it's as good. And I don't think that E like you, there's no upgrade path. Yeah. You can't put the EF lenses on the C eighty. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess you could. Um it's just aren't gonna speed boost, it'd be a different adapter, but you don't want to. Yeah. You don't want to have to then keep adapting those lenses. And so I think that because of the lack of Super 35 support for RF mount, the C70 is a non-option because it is not an upgrade path and you would only be getting a C70 because you would be getting a C80 later. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like you're saving maybe around $2,000 on the camera, like if you get a used C70. Mm-hmm. But you're probably making up for that. And for one thing, needing to buy a $600 speed booster. And then, yeah, like any lenses you buy is sort of a dead end. Like I could see you doing it as like a getting one to like you get the C seven C eighty and then you eventually get a C seventy when you find like a really good deal. Like, mm-hmm. oh here's one for less than two thousand yeah. dollars for some reason. Yeah, I get like a B cam basically. Yeah, I'm gonna grab that, I'm gonna slap the twenty four to one oh five F four on it and that's gonna be my running gun like camera. Yeah. And it's it's not a big deal if like a kid pours water on it whenever <laughs> recording a youth camp video or something. <laughs> yeah. So like I think that that maybe is going to be like a nice mm-hmm. option, but the C80 is is what you ultimately want in my opinion. Yeah. Even though you won't be able to use your CX Express cards, I think that the C80. <laughs> yeah, I think the C80 is a better choice for you over something like the Pixis because of the autofocus and mm-hmm. the uh, the non raw codec options. Yeah, I like I, I like the idea that between those two cameras, I like the idea that for one thing I could just pick up and carry the C80 around, and I could shoot something on it and deliver it that day. I don't feel like the Pixis mm-hmm. would really allow that. Yeah, I don't know how to as well balance color from a Sony or a Canon to match uh, Fuji footage. Yep, I can do it for L mount all day, standing mm-hmm. on my head from V log. For I don't C log too. I don't know. Yeah, I probably could match it. I'm not saying I can't. I just yeah. I had to figure that out. Yep, yep. That'd be a challenge. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, and then as far as like, what does Daniel need? I mean, I'm looking at your list here. You have like. Excellent image quality, obviously. Raw capable. I feel like the raw on the C80 is actually limited. It's not like that's kind of a problem. You think so? It's like how much raw do you want to shoot? It shoots raw, but it feels like it's like raw light almost. Yeah. And I still can't quite get my head around what the difference between Canon and Canon's like Cinema Raw or whatever they call it and like actual just straight up raw. Mm-hmm. It feels like there's some sauce in there that's yeah, not the same having. as like raw out of a out of a Venice mm-hmm. or whatever or out of a a, a Pixis even it just it, the way that they talk about it makes it seem like it's different yeah and I'm be curious if it's like we don't ever shoot raw but like if it's the same quality of something as if you were just getting like black magic raw or red raw mm-hmm. or uh, N raw or something like that so yeah. yeah and I mean like for me you know we've never really shot that much in it and so i don't see it as a big need but it's more like if i was going to spend this much on a camera i feel like it would be a nice capability to have for like if we were to shoot a film yeah you'd want to have it and then you can shoot raw externally on the c80 but you can't shoot 6k you can only shoot up to 4k which is kind of a bummer limiting because like we would want to i would i i don't even know what raw it is like i don't think you can get prores raw Mm -hmm. or whatever or like black magic but be raw because like for me that's what i would i would love to have coming yeah. out of it is like give me the b raw footage because i'm going to edit this in mm. in davinci resolve yeah i don't know how that works from that perspective mm-hmm. but and the other downside i think to the cad is not having external like usb support like you don't get cf express or uh, right. ssd recording yeah that's a kind of a huge bummer for something that's that expensive mm-hmm does it, are you able to run it on like just straight power without a battery? Uh, I believe you can. I mean, it has an external power jack, so I'm sure you can. Sure. But. Or I guess you could get one of those like hot, like they make those V-mount plates that have a battery built into them. So you can just hot swap V-mount batteries. Mm, there you go. Those are cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was one thing that I kind of thought of with this whole decision is I want to have a good uh, native battery option mm-hmm. that, you know, let, let's say lasts at least an hour of filming, which, you know, most of these cameras do. 
but you also want to have external power to use it with something like a V-mount plate. Because that's one thing that I find really annoying about using a standard mirrorless camera is like when I put it in my rig, I feel like even with the X-H2S, I feel like I've got this strange... Like, it doesn't quite work the way I'd want. You right. Know, I, I power it over USB, and it feels like there's all these weird caveats, and I don't know. It's just like, I'd, I'd rather just have, like, a plug that I could just plug power into. Right, right. That makes total sense. I don't know. I I feel like the FX6 Mark II is going to be the right choice. Yeah. I guess we'll just have to wait and see what it is. Like, like the C80 seems super, super compelling, but it feels like it's still kind of, there's a just a few things where it's like, man, I spent six thousand dollars on a camera and now i'm investing into rf lenses and like it can do everything but like it also doesn't have cf express Mm -hmm. and like it has raw asterisk and i don't like i don't know it's 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 got all the things but it kind of does all it doesn't like have all the things yeah can't you 6k over the over hdmi can't record to an ssd or whatever it's funny because i i feel like what's going to happen is the fx6 mark ii is going to come out and it's going to be a really good camera on paper and i'm afraid it's going to be like the burano oh that'd be terrible where they where where it seems really exciting but then when people start testing it it has all these weird little caveats well that's like classic sony is yeah. they, they they're like we, if it can do it, we're going to let it do it, even if it's at a compromise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see what that is. But I don't know. I think this is an interesting space. It's something I'd like to expand into at some point. Yep. I still can't decide whether it's, you know, it's like, at, at what point does it make sense to spend that much money on that sort of camera versus investing in other stuff? Because, I mean, it's an expensive setup, right? Like getting the camera, getting a couple of lenses. I mean, call it like eight thousand dollars, you know, yep. to like to like really get going. It's a real commitment. But then, on the other hand, it's like, I mean, I think the classic answer is lights, right? They, you know, buy lights instead. But mm-hmm. I mean, does it really make sense to spend eight thousand dollars on lights? Like, what are you even going to get? <laughs> you know. So I don't know. It's. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure Aperture could tell you. Yeah, I'm sure they could. It's hard to figure out at what point does it make sense to make that leap, and like, when is it worth it for workflow improvements or just your enjoyment of using it? Or getting a little bit better image quality. Like, when is that actually worth doing? Uh, and, you know, like, how do you know when you've hit that point? I don't yeah. know the answer to that. I think it's it's tough to suss out. It would be a pretty, it would be a decent leap in image quality, I think. But also, it's still just one camera mm-hmm. where whenever we shoot, we are typically shooting with two or more cameras. Yep. And so that becomes like, it's a like, great, this camera looks way better, but now one of the camera does, doesn't look as good or two yeah. of the cameras don't look as good. And now it's super obvious when we switch between. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Cause like at some, at some point you have to like take steps forward. Yeah. Right. So, to be clear, what I'm saying is the XX, XH2S is the one that looks really good in that situation. <laughs> and then the C80 is the uh, one that doesn't look yep. as good. Yep. That's uh yeah, that's where I thought you were going with that. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, it seems like we're kind of, uh, you know, I don't think I have a clear path forward on that. I don't think I'm taking any actions now or anything, but no. uh, I guess we're going to wait and see what that FX6 Mark II looks like. Yeah, I think the C80 is something that's really cool to drool over, but I don't think it fits what you're trying, like what you do mm-hmm. enough to like make it make sense. I wish the Pixis had, you could spend like $100 and get XH or H265 support. Yeah. Yeah, that feels like. It feels like if it had that, I'd be considering that camera. Yep, so, probably. That's a shame. Oh, well. I mean, it, just just like the last conversation we had about switching camera systems, I mean, it seems like we're both just going to be in Sony in the next five years. So. <laughs> it kind of feels that way. Yep. Here we come. That's it for the show today. Thanks for joining us. And if you liked it, tell a friend so they can check it out too. You can find out more about the show at www.cameragearpodcast.com. And you can find us on Twitter at Camera Gear Pod. We'll be back with more next week.